As a real estate professional, you should understand how various government powers come into play when it comes to real estate ownership. While you may not encounter these on a regular basis, you should have a basic understanding of each of these areas. One acronym you can use to help you remember governmental powers in real estate is PEAT. P stands for police power, E for eminent domain, T for taxation, and E for escheat. Now let's explore each of these in more detail. Police power. Police power refers to the right of the United States government to make laws and to enforce those laws to ensure the order, safety, health, morals, and general welfare of citizens of the United States. Under that broad umbrella, the government has the right to regulate how U.S. citizens use real property, and it does that through police powers. One type of law that falls under police powers is zoning laws, which are the laws that separate or divide areas of land into different districts depending on their use. Zoning laws generally apply to large areas of land rather than just individual pieces of real estate. Different areas or districts inside a municipality may be zoned for residential, commercial, or industrial uses. City planning laws are another type of law that falls under police powers. City planning laws are closely related to zoning laws and include laws about the electrical, sewer, and other facilities that a municipality's residents use. For example, an entire section of a city may be zoned for residential use, so an industrial factory could not be built or operated in that area without changing the zoning laws. Without zoning laws, we might have residential houses on the same block as factories and commercial stores. Such a situation would likely cause aggravation to residents because of noise levels, parking shortages, and traffic patterns. Zoning laws help keep businesses and factories to designated parts of the town. Other examples of police powers include things like building codes and health standards. The government has a vested interest in making sure that public health, safety, and welfare of U.S. citizens are protected. So, building codes and health standards provide minimum acceptable standards for compliance. Building codes are different for residential real estate and for commercial or industrial properties and depend to a certain extent on the intended use for the property. Building codes and health standards include everything from how wide doorways and stairwells must be to the materials and methods used in construction. Things like plumbing codes, electrical standards, occupancy rules, parking and traffic impact, and even swimming pool regulations all fall under building codes. Adhering to building codes and health standards means that real estate is designed to safely be used for its intended purpose. City or municipality inspectors have the right and duty to confirm that buildings meet applicable standards. If deficiencies are noted, police power gives them the authority to enforce those laws. Finally, another kind of police power that impacts real estate is rent controls. Rent controls are designed to protect the public by putting an upper limit on the amount landlords can charge tenants to lease space. Rent controls either provide a ceiling, a maximum amount that could be charged in rent, or by providing controls around how much a landlord can increase rents. People renting real property in areas that are rent controlled can have peace of mind knowing that their housing will remain affordable and that their landlords cannot legally raise their rent beyond what's allowed by rent control laws. Now, let's take a look at an example of police power. Amy Baker bought a house in a quiet cul-de-sac 
in a residential neighborhood subdivision 10 years ago. A few months ago, Amy decided to go into business for herself as a commercial baker and wants to build an addition onto her home for a commercial kitchen and a 24-7 retail store where her customers could buy her products. Amy's neighbors have real concerns about what this change would mean for their neighborhood because of increased traffic, noise, aesthetics, lighting, etc. Fortunately for Amy's neighbors, but unfortunately for Amy, her plans would likely violate the city's zoning ordinances, which are designed to protect the residents of Amy's neighborhood by making the area safe and comfortable for residential property owners and residents. Now that we have explored police powers, the P in our PEAT acronym, let's look at the first E, which stands for eminent domain. Eminent domain. Eminent domain refers to the right the United States federal and state governments have to take private land or private property for public use or economic development. When eminent domain powers are used, the property owner has the right to receive just compensation for the taking of their property. In this section, we will explore each element of this definition to give you a better understanding of eminent domain powers. Most commonly, eminent domain applies when the government needs to build a new government building, construct or work on an existing roadway, or utilities. If there are one or more pieces of private property that will be affected by the government's plans, eminent domain allows the government to take that property under certain circumstances and conditions. In some areas, the laws require the government to make an offer to purchase the property first before enforcing eminent domain. Earlier, we stated that exercising eminent domain means the property owner is entitled to receive just compensation. But what exactly does that mean? The requirement that the government taking the property must pay just compensation is intended to make sure the property owner is in the same position financially after his or her property is taken through eminent domain. In practice, just compensation often simply means fair market value for the property taking into consideration the property's highest and best use. Fair market value refers to what a willing buyer would pay a willing seller in a voluntary sale of the property when both parties were fully informed about the features of the property and of the transaction itself. Some states call eminent domain by different names. For example, in New York State, it is also known as appropriation. And in Louisiana, eminent domain is also called expropriation. Condemnation is another word that can be used to describe eminent domain. However, don't confuse this definition of condemnation with the word that means property is uninhabitable because there's something wrong with it. In the context of eminent domain authority, condemnation simply means that the government is formally taking title to the entire parcel of property or to some portion of it. No matter what it is called, eminent domain requires just compensation to the property owner. An entire parcel of real property can be condemned using eminent domain. However, eminent domain can also be used to take just a portion of the parcel. If this happens, the property owner may also be entitled to severance compensation. The federal government has deferred to state governments, saying each state has the right to determine what constitutes public use for purposes of using eminent domain powers. Every state in the U.S. has this authority. Eminent domain can be delegated by law to cities or municipalities, or even in some cases to private companies or individuals. However, the federal government can also exercise eminent domain powers. When it does so, it can actually take land and property 
directly through congressional action. If Congress passes an act transferring property to the government, individual property owners can then sue the U.S. government for compensation through the court system. So far, we've explored the use of eminent domain by the federal government, by states, or municipalities. However, those entities can also delegate eminent domain authority to private individuals or entities in certain circumstances. These may include railroad companies, private utility companies, or any other private entity or person that may be able to establish that they need the property for public or civic uses. Although eminent domain may be exercised by a private entity or individual, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that eminent domain may not be used for the purpose of advancing the economic interest of private parties to be given ownership or use of the property taken. Here are a few examples of some of the uses property has been taken under eminent domain authority in the United States. Constructing public buildings. Building or expanding a railway or roadway. Constructing aqueducts to provide drinking water to a city. Maintaining navigable waterways like canals. Producing war materials, aiding in defense readiness for the country. Constructing airports. Establishing national parks and national forests. Preserving places of historic interest. Protecting the environment through nature preserves. And establishing national monuments. Property across the nation has been taken through eminent domain powers to be used to house and facilitate government services, provide for infrastructure and defense, and provide public facilities and spaces used by citizens in communities around the country. You may be asking yourself what happens in a situation where a property owner doesn't agree with the government asserting eminent domain over their property. What rights or recourse does the property owner actually have? A property owner who objects to an eminent domain action can sue the government in court, challenging the action either by claiming either that the government's intended use of the property does not constitute a necessary public use, or that just compensation hasn't been offered or paid. This can be an uphill battle for property owners, however. Remember that the government only needs to compensate the property owners for fair market value of the property. Property owners are not entitled to compensation for their inconvenience, for lost profits, in the case of a business affected by eminent domain authority, etc. While you may not personally become involved in an eminent domain action as a real estate professional, it is nevertheless important for you to have a basic understanding of what the law provides, both for governmental entities and for individual property owners affected by eminent domain authority. Let's look at an example of eminent domain authority in action that might help make a complex topic clearer. The city of Metropolis wants to build a public park and monument in the center of the city. There are three homeowners whose homes are located in the area where the park would be located. The city approached the homeowners and offered to buy their homes for more than fair market value. Two of the homeowners agreed to the proposed purchase price and sold their homes. However, the third homeowner does not want to sell his home. It's been in his family for generations. If he and the city are unable to come to agreement on the terms of a sale, the city could use eminent domain authority to take the property from the homeowner and would only be required to pay him fair market value for his home. In this scenario, he will not only be forced to move, he will also receive less than his neighbors who agreed to the city's initial offer to buy their homes. Another example that comes up from time to time is a reverse eminent domain situation, where a homeowner sues the government claiming they are entitled to just compensation because the government, 
in effect, seized their property. John has lived near the airport in Metropolis for years. However, Metropolis recently changed its runway configurations, and now John's home is directly beneath the flight path for incoming and departing airplanes. Because of this, property values in his neighborhood have plummeted. John could sue for damages, saying the government has, in effect, taken away his property rights. If he is successful in his suit, the government would have to buy his home at the fair market value before the airport changed its runway configuration and flight patterns. Taxation Let's go back to our PEAT acronym, which can help you remember four important types of government actions for real estate. So far, we have looked at the P by exploring police powers, and we learned about eminent domain, which is represented by the first E in PEAT. Now, we'll turn to the T, which stands for taxation. Odds are good that you are already familiar with the concept of taxation. After all, we pay taxes every day on the things we purchase at retail stores and restaurants. Our income is also taxed, and most people are required to file annual income tax returns. Real estate is also taxed. Just as paying your income taxes or paying sales tax on the things that you buy is not optional, property taxes are also required. Any person, corporation, or other organization that owns real estate must pay property taxes every year. The U.S. federal government cannot tax real property. The Constitution prohibits this. However, state and local governments do have the authority to levy property taxes on property owners. When people are considering buying new real estate, they are usually very interested in knowing how much they can expect to pay every year in property taxes. Property tax can vary widely in different parts of the country and, in some cases, in different parts of the same major metropolitan area. This is because different counties or other taxing authorities have higher or lower tax rate than others. So the answer to the question, how much are property taxes, really varies. The amount of property taxes a property owner will have to pay depends on the assessed value of the real estate and on where the property is located. In most states, the assessed value is determined by the most recent sale of the property with an inflation adjustment added each year. Sometimes, property owners grumble about the amount they have to pay in property taxes. While property taxes can sometimes seem like a big obligation, it is important to remember that they pay for a wide array of public services. Your property tax dollars go to fund programs and services in your area. Some of the things your property tax dollars go to fund include road construction and maintenance, police services, fire department services, emergency responders, public works department and services, public parks, recreational trails used for walking, hiking, skiing, etc., state, city, and or county libraries, traffic lights, street lights, sidewalks and gutters, public schools, Salaries for local government officials and public service employees. If a property owner feels the amount of his or her property taxes is too high, he or she can appeal to the taxing authority. Property may be reassessed, which may end up lowering the amount of taxes due. However, if the assessed property value comes back unexpectedly higher than the taxed amount, the property owner could find himself or herself facing a higher tax burden. For people buying real estate with funds borrowed from a bank, mortgage company, or other lender, the lender can include one-twelfth of the estimated annual property tax bill 
with each month's mortgage payment. Money is set aside in an escrow account, and the lender handles sending the tax payment to the county on a semi-annual or annual basis, or other frequency, depending on when tax payments are due. Paying real estate taxes in this manner makes things easier for the property owner, who does not need to worry about coming up with a large sum of money when the tax bill due date arrives. This escrow process for real estate taxes operates the same way, where many lenders handle property insurance premiums. So what happens if someone doesn't pay their property taxes? When a property owner does not have funds set aside in escrow to pay their property taxes, for example, when there's no mortgage on the property, he or she is responsible for paying property taxes in full when they're due. If taxes are not paid as required, the taxing authority can place a lien against the property. This means that when the property is ultimately sold, the taxing authority will be paid the amount of taxes due before the property owner receives the sales proceeds. In situations where property taxes are significantly delinquent or when the amount owed in back taxes reaches a certain threshold, as determined by each state, county, or other taxing authority, the taxing authority may actually force a sale of the property in order to receive the tax dollars they are owed. Mortgage borrowers who do not set aside funds in escrow for their property taxes should understand that most mortgage lenders consider a failure to pay property taxes as the equivalent of defaulting on the mortgage loan. This is serious, as it can trigger foreclosure actions. Property tax liens have a higher authority over property than mortgage liens do, so lenders may take foreclosure actions to protect themselves against loss. Some relief may be available to certain property owners in the form of a property tax refund. Some states and local governments provide homeowners with property tax refunds in certain circumstances. For example, a homeowner may be eligible for a property tax refund if their income was below a specific level and if their property taxes increased by more than a certain percentage over the previous year. If property tax refunds are available in their state, homeowners may need to file a separate property tax return in addition to filing income tax returns. Here is an example of property taxes. Aaron and Ann taxpayers own their home. They receive an annual property tax statement from their county. Their most recent statement values their home at $235,000 and calculated their property taxes for the year as $2,775. Aaron and Ann have a mortgage loan and property taxes are escrowed for them and paid to the county by their lender. So, for the next year, their mortgage payments will include an extra $231.25 each month, which is one-twelfth of $2,775. Their lender will hold these funds for them until the property taxes are due and payable, at which point the lender will send the tax payment directly to the county. As cheat. Now, let's turn to the last E in our PEAT acronym, which stands for is cheat. Is cheat is a fancy word that simply refers to property that was publicly owned reverting to the state when there are no identifiable heirs capable of assuming ownership of the property. The government's power to escheat property can come into play in a couple of different ways. The first situation involves a property owner who owned their home or other real property individually and who died without leaving a valid will and without leaving named beneficiaries where available through a beneficiary deed or transfer on death deed. 
if that property owner did not have any identifiable heirs under state law, the property would as cheat to the state. Laws governing property ownership are designed to allow property owners to determine how their property will be disposed of or distributed during their lifetimes and at their deaths. When someone creates a will, transfers their property into a trust, or identifies beneficiaries for their real estate, they are controlling disposition of that property. However, someone who does not have identifiable heirs but fails to take such planning measures may unintentionally be naming the state as the beneficiary of their property. Escheat is a measure of last resort. Each state's intestacy laws govern how property will pass when a resident of that state dies without a will. Spouses and children are given priority. In many cases, descent and distribution laws provide a complex web designed to identify the nearest living heir entitled to inherit real estate and other property. Its cheat only comes into play when it is impossible to identify or locate such heirs. The second scenario is similar and can come into play when property has been abandoned and there are no identifiable owners or heirs for the property. In such a case, the state can exercise its authority to escheat the real estate, so the state would become the lawful owner of the parcel. Here is an important point to keep in mind. While some of the governmental powers we have discussed in this section give authority to federal, state, and local governments for privately owned real estate, the power to escheat real property rests solely with state governments. Neither county or municipal governments, nor other individuals, have the authority to take property by escheat. Here's an example of how escheat laws may come into play. George Batchelor owned his home and died intestate, without a will. George was an only child who had never married or had children. His parents were also only children. After conducting a diligent search for identifiable heirs under the state's intestacy laws of descent and distribution, the state was unable to identify any living heirs to inherit George's estate, including his real estate. In this scenario, ownership of George's home would pass to the state under the state's authority to escheat real property. Now, let's say that the lot and home next door to George's house had been sitting abandoned for years. The owners couldn't be located and real estate taxes hadn't been paid. The state's unclaimed property laws would allow the owners to come forward for a certain time period to reclaim their property. If they fail to come forward to reclaim the property, the property would escheat to the state. Let's recap. In this lesson, we have explored a variety of governmental powers over real estate, including the government's authority to make and enforce laws designed to protect the public, police powers, the government's authority to seize privately owned real property for public use with just compensation, eminent domain, the authority for state and local governments to levy real estate taxes on privately owned real property, taxation. And we looked at scenarios in which state governments have the authority to take ownership and control of property that has been abandoned or property for which there is no other identifiable heir, is cheat powers. Like the framework for other governmental laws and regulations we live under, these four types of government authority are designed to protect citizens by providing for government action in certain circumstances.